Hello. All right, episode five. The jury is picked and the trial of Stephen Avery is ready to begin on Monday. February 12, 2007. The eyes of an entire state are transfixed on a small courtroom in Chilton. One of the most high-profile murder trials in Wisconsin history is set to begin. But episode five of Making a Murderer begins earlier, as Stephen Avery's attorneys argue to have admitted into evidence a vial of Avery's blood that they claim the Manitowoc County Sheriff's Department may have used to plant Avery's DNA in Teresa Hallbach's RAV4. May have. This was bombshell evidence. Remember, when he found it, Avery's attorney, Jerome Buting, called it a red letter day for the defense. The state clearly was freaked out. Norm Gahn looks at it, and from that point on, you could tell that he was extremely worried. Gahn, a special prosecutor, was so terrified of this new evidence that he fought his hardest to get it excluded, right? After all, it was a supposed smoking gun that would finally prove the defense's theory that law enforcement framed Stephen Avery, right? There's no way he should want that evidence admitted, right? But he did. I just cannot emphasize too much. Give us the chance to meet with this planting frame-up defense. Wait, what? What? Wait, what? Did you miss the first part of that? Where they were trying to fight to keep it out? <laughs> because they lost, all right? And because they lost, and the judge ruled to let it be admitted, that's when they start this, I can't emphasize enough, give us the chance to blah, blah, blah. Yeah, no shit, Sherlock. So you can do everything you can, basically, by trying to get the FBI to do a test that they stopped doing because it's unreliable, because it's shit because they don't have time to do it. They don't have time to run that sort of a test. Something that would take months they're going to have to come up with in a couple of weeks for you. Um, yeah. Yeah, they were trying to fight to keep it out and they lost and that's why he was begging to let them have the FBI test it. Okay. Why on earth would he want to meet that frame-up defense, especially if he was as scared of the evidence as Buting made him out to be? Why would he argue to have it admitted into evidence? First of all, he was scared when they first found it, just like Buting was excited. Um, that is what happened the day they found it. Now, months or two years or whatever the hell it is later, that they go to talk with the judge about this evidence being admitted or not um yeah he probably doesn't care because he knows that they're gonna get someone to test it and say that there's no EDTA in those samples because he knows that once the defense uses that evidence to make an affirmative accusation that law enforcement planted blood from the vial at the crime scene then the defense has to support this accusation with affirmative evidence. And he knows that the defense has thus far not been able to do so. They don't have Andrew Colborn on security camera opening up the package that contained the vial or removing blood from it. They don't have James Lank's fingerprints on the vial. All they have is a broken container and conjecture that because those two men had just been deposed in a civil suit, they might have had a reason to violate their sacred duty to uphold the law and commit any number of felonies on the hunch that doing so might cause Stephen Avery to drop his lawsuit. Okay, yeah, uh, because Link and Colburn were not on trial, all right, so the defense didn't have to prove a damn thing, okay? This was about reasonable doubt. This was about the jury having some sort of an alternate explanation to how the blood might have gotten there, how the key might have gotten there, other than Stephen Avery put it there. Why? Because of that ridiculous Denny ruling that they're not allowed to introduce third party, this third party liability bullshit, unless they're able to prove motive that was that was the problem 
they can't name anyone they can't name any alternate suspects because uh, by name because they would have to prove that they killed her in order to name anyone but they were allowed to prove or try to prove that it is at least possible that that evidence was planted by the police because that's the only thing that they had to defend him with because they weren't allowed to introduce alternate suspects that were not investigated why they should have been investigated <laughs> anyway we're talking about the blood though here again extraordinary claims such as those require extraordinary evidence to support them and the prosecution knew that the defense didn't have any so it was just fine with avery pursuing a frame-up defense once the trial begins defense attorney dean strang dives into this conspiracy head first tell um first of all this is not something that they were excited about doing okay you listen to their the parts of of the documentary where they're talking about this is not something that you want to do you don't want to go around accusing the police of misconduct um, because first of all it's very hard to prove and second of all it's hard to be believed by a jury or anyone else that the police would do something like that so that being their last and only option of defense that's what they had to do um, it's not like that's what they wanted to do so Strang just dove right in yeah he's given it all he's got because he's a badass and he's doing the best he can with what he was allowed to use telling jurors in his opening statement that law enforcement immediately targeted the Avery property it's Thursday evening about five o'clock November 3 when Mrs. Halbach reports Teresa missing. That very night, Calumet is calling the Manitowoc County Sheriff's Department for a little bit of help. And who do we get? We get Sergeant Andy Colbert. And he's told, look, two places we'd like to sort of check out and see if Teresa Halbach showed up on Monday. The Zipporah residence and Stephen Avery. Well, that's a name that rings a bell. You better believe less than three weeks or about three weeks after his deposition and it is interesting that of those two places that sergeant colburn is asked to check out and inquire after teresa halbach he only goes to one goes to stephen avery's home that wouldn't be by any chance because avery's home was the last place anyone definitively knew halbach was that day would it her family knew through her no because if you listen to the, the calls between Remicker and Uyghur, I believe it is, they believe that Zipper was the last place that she was that day, going by her phone records. Okay, so yeah, Steven was the last appointment she had, but because she was not able to find the zippers, they suspected that she went on to the Avery's and then went back to the zippers afterwards because she did eventually show up there. Her employer, Auto Trader Magazine, that she was on the property late in the afternoon of October 31st and no one ever saw her after that. So it would be entirely logical that that would be a place for a law enforcement officer to start in. Okay, <laughs> no one ever saw her after that nobody knows that for sure somebody saw her after that if Stephen didn't kill her somebody saw her and it wasn't Stephen um, also if you go by what the police are saying that that at first that they thought I mean, that was the way that they were going with their investigation they thought that the zipper residence is the last place she went so them starting with Steven? No. No. Investigated. And it wasn't as though he was just blindly targeting Steven out of all the Averys who lived on the property. Steven was the one who called Auto Trader on the 31st 
to specifically request that Teresa Halbach come to his property to take pictures. This, remember, came just a few months after Halbach told co-workers at Auto Trader Magazine that Avery gave her the creeps when he answered her knock at his door wearing nothing but a towel. All right, and we're gonna go into this crap again because Stephen Avery called specifically to Auto Trader and asked for Teresa. He asked for the same girl that had been out here before. Um, like I said before, that is not unusual. If you have worked with someone, you like their work, you want them to come back and do more work for you. That's not unusual. That's not suspicious. That is not any, there's nothing wrong with that. Another thing, he does not give her the creeps. She laughed about this. Okay. She laughed about it and the person she was talking to on the phone from Auto Trader, who she told this to, passing conversation that also included going trick or treating, you know, kids and things like that. This passing conversation included, oh, you know, on one time he came to the to the door in a towel. And the Auto Trader lady's like, ew, and they laughed. Hardly the creeps. But, you know, you're starting to sound like crass. And now that same guy was very possibly the last person to see her alive? Possibly. One would think an investigator to be incompetent if he didn't go to that guy's property right away. Besides, the state's very first witness, Brendan Dassey's older brother Bobby, was able to place Hallbach with Avery on the 31st. That was the only evidentiary value he provided as a witness, yet the defense calls for a mistrial when he recounts a joke he said his uncle Stephen told him a few days after Hallbach disappeared. Well, my buddy Mike was over too, and he asked us, it, it sounded like he was joking, honestly, but he asked us if he wanted, he wanted us to help him get rid of the body. This prompted a nearly immediate and ultimately unsuccessful motion for a mistrial because the defense had no inkling that Dassey had ever heard Avery tell this joke. The defense claimed it was tantamount to hearing a confession from Avery, but wouldn't go so far as to call it prosecutorial misconduct. That is, that Kratz withheld this evidence from the defense or intentionally elicited what may have been inadmissible hearsay evidence from Dassey in an effort to poison jurors against Avery. Okay, that is actually what happened. Kratz knew damn well what he was doing when he questioned Bobby about this. This was never in any of Bobby Dassey's statements. Look at him. It's not in his statements. It's in his buddy Mike's statement. Okay, this is something that his, his friend had a conversation with Stephen about. And Bobby walked in during that conversation. He wasn't part of it. He heard it. He overheard it. This is hearsay because this friend of his is not in court. We're not going to hear his testimony. We just have his statement of this conversation that he had with Stephen. And the reason why they tried to get it thrown out is because when Kratz asked the question, very specifically asked about the date. That's really important because the date that he claimed that this happened on was before Teresa was even reported missing. Okay, so that is a problem. That is Kratz intentionally out of his own mouth putting a date and a question trying to pull in some hearsay from his buddy and get all this thrown in that just shows Stephen had to have killed her because this happened before she was even reported missing. You think the jury's going to miss that? No. Obviously not, because Dean Strang jumped all over it, as he should have. Uh, they did come to a conclusion to avoid a mistrial, but it, it's pretty ridiculous that, that Kratz tried to pull that shit and again trying to taint the jury with this complete bullshit this is not what happened it's not the way it happened if you 
look at the evidence, the actual evidence of, you know, what day this happened on. It couldn't have and did not happen on the day that they said it did, on the 2nd, I believe. Didn't happen on that day. Couldn't have. It had to have happened on the 4th or the 5th. The 4th. Happened on the 4th. Sorry, I had to think about that for a second. Because on the 3rd, Barb, Janda, Tadic, now, she sees a deer on the road. She, t she comes home from work or whatever. She tells Bobby, hey, there's a deer out there on the road. It's been hit by a car. Bobby goes out to get it. He brings it home. The next morning on the 4th, he takes it down to the mobile station and gets a tag for the deer. And that night, he's hanging it up and cleaning it in the garage. And that was the night on the 4th when his buddy was over. That's when the conversation happened, not two days earlier, because two days earlier, Teresa still had not been reported missing. By the 4th, it was all over the freaking news. And the cops had already been out to question Stephen. So, yeah. It, that's a really big difference very big difference getting that date wrong and I'm pretty sure that Kratz did that intentionally more significantly for the making of murder filmmakers though Kratz identified this conversation as having happened on November 3rd before Halbach is ever reported missing that suggests what exactly that Kratz was up to no good that he was part of the conspiracy more likely, it suggests that he forgot the date that the joke actually was told. Kratz, the DA, forgot the date. Like I said, very big difference before Teresa's reported missing and the day after she's reported missing and then shit's all over the news. Okay? And everybody knows that... that she was out at Stevens because he was on the news giving a giving an interview. He'd already been questioned by the police. He told the 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 TV news lady that the police had already come out. They said, "Can we look around?" We know that that happened on the fourth. Colburn came out on the third, questioned him outside. Link and Remaker, I believe, came by on the fourth, asked if they could go inside and look around. He said, sure, I got no problem with that. Let's them in, they go look around, they leave. News reporter comes out, shit's all over the news on the 4th, and this is when the conversation happened. It was on the 4th, between Bobby's friend and Steven, this bad joke, um, but not earlier than it was already out on the news. The series never follows through with this vague accusation against Kratz, though. It merely moves on to a vague accusation against Judge Patrick Willis, who denied a defense motion to be allowed to name other people who might have killed Teresa Halbach. I'm really worried Denny. that the jury might think, God, you know, can we really acquit this man when we don't know, when we can't tell them who we think did it? That's going to be, on a human level, the hardest thing, I think. And the judge has really tied our hands on that. You know why? Because the defense never provided any evidence that anyone other than Stephen Avery killed Teresa Halbach, not a single shred. Okay, the defense doesn't have to prove who killed her. All right, guy, I don't know where you got your law degree from. I don't have a law, law degree. I don't need one to know that much. The defense does not have to prove who killed her. All right? The state has the burden of proof to prove that Stephen killed her. The defense should have been allowed to present a full defense for their client. And not allowing him to, because of this ridiculous Denny ruling, is completely unfair. I mean, how many murder trials do have you seen where the defendant is not allowed to say this person this specific person had access had motive means whatever the hell 
Um, I have no proof that they did it, but they could have. Um, most of the time, that's what that that's how they defend themselves, and by the, by saying, "Hey, jury, we got some reasonable doubt. Couldn't have been this because it could have been that. Could have been that. Could have been that. I mean, all these other people, but." Stevens lawyers were not allowed to do that because of this Denny ruling. Yet somehow a judge should allow Avery's lawyers to start pointing fingers at other people without being able to substantiate their accusations? Yeah. That might work in a Netflix series, but it doesn't work in a court of law. Yes, it actually does, most of the time. <laughs> And speaking of this series, episode 5 makes vague accusations against Hallbach's brother, her roommate, and her ex-boyfriend, too. Often, the most obvious suspect in a homicide is a spouse. You look at the spouse, right? Yes, the people we love the most. Or and you look at a boyfriend or an ex-boyfriend, don't you? Yes. How about a roommate who doesn't report the victim missing for three, almost four days? This is a reference to both the roommate and the ex-boyfriend, who was able to hack into Hallbach's voicemail as he led the search party for her. Did he use it? Okay. The defense was not trying to say that these guys killed her. Okay, the defense is trying to say that the police did not do a proper investigation. You start at the people that are closest, just like just like the detective said in his answer, you start with the people that are the closest, the ones you love the most, to the victim. That's where you start. Not with some stranger guy who she had an appointment with that day. You start with people that are closest to them and you work your way out. They didn't do that. They didn't investigate any of those people. None of them. Uh, not at all. And that's, that's what they're saying to delete some of her voicemails after the day she disappeared? Did he do so because he was in fact the real killer? Episode 5 never explains. It just sort of leaves this kind of, sort of allegation of evidence tampering out there. But it never claims that relevant voicemails were ever deleted, or even that any voicemails were deleted. Oh, Whoa, hold on. Yes. There is absolutely proof that voicemails were deleted. Absolutely, because if Teresa's boss, business partner, her family, um, and Ryan, her ex-boyfriend, they're all calling her and finding that her voicemail is full on a certain day, on the 3rd, then there is no way that she would get a new message on the 11th unless at least one message was deleted so yes even though I I've watched so much outside of and read the transcripts outside of the documentary I don't remember for sure if that was actually shown in the documentary but I'm pretty sure that it was that that's about where they got cut off and they were there was objections and well, we got to remove the jury and you know all this other nonsense went on there were voicemails at least one voicemail deleted that happened that is a fact um you look at her records and you can see that um that is on the documentary the uh phone call that they're playing, they're interviewing, I guess, someone on the phone or whatever, <laughs> that guy is the one that, that tells you that. ...that at some point after callers to Hallbox phone got a mailbox full message, they were again able to leave voicemails. Does the series show that voicemails from after the point Hallbox disappeared were definitively deleted? No. Does the series show that any voicemails at all were definitively deleted? No. Yes. Yes, you don't get a full mailbox message by several different people and then days later 
you are able to leave a message because the mailbox is no longer full. Okay, that is a, that's more than enough proof to show that at least one voicemail was deleted. And I am going to just go right ahead and say more than one was deleted just by the fact that the guy that was on the phone um, that had gone through her records said that the amount of voicemails including her newest message from the 11th was not enough currently to fill up her mailbox so that tells me that there is now he doesn't go into more detail about how much more storage space she's got but he does say that the messages that are on there that are showing right now with the newest one being from the 11th is not enough to fill up her mailbox. It just leaves the hint of wrongdoing in the air as it moves on to the next bag accusation. Because it's leaving, leaving it hanging in the air because they're not allowed to name the person who accessed her voicemail yet. Mike, her brother, who later comes on he admits that he accessed her voicemails and he listened to them. He, he says that he listened to, he thinks, all of them. He says that he did not delete any of them. So they are, and they already know that he's going to say that when they question him. But they're not allowed to name any other people, like the ex-boyfriend, who also had the password, who also could have accessed, who also could have deleted. I'm pretty sure we're going to get into that uh, here very soon. Moreover, it never explores the cell phone records from Stephen Avery's phone, which show that at three different times on October 31st, he called Hallbox phone from his. Two of those times, he used star 67 in an effort to mask his number. Why would he do this since it could be safely assumed that he would want the photographer to know it was him calling so she could call him back? Unless, of course, he didn't want her to know it was him calling on the date. He didn't want her to call him back. He wanted her to answer the phone, which she did one of the times he called. The other two times he got a voicemail she disappeared after she was last heard from heading to his property. This seems to be just as, if not more compelling phone record evidence than the maybe possibly deleted voicemails, but it is totally ignored in making a murderer. Instead, the series shifts its focus to Pam Stern, a second cousin of Teresa Hallbox, who found her car hidden in Avery's salvage yard. And I... Okay. I'm going to back this up and start it back at the part where Pam Stern comes on because it's getting kind of long. Um, so we'll continue this video in just a minute. 